All right, it's time for chapter seven of Sea of Monsters. Get yourselves comfortable. I'm on my couch because I got tired of my chair. It hurts my hip. So let's sit back and enjoy. I accept gifts from a stranger. Now, if we remember in chapters one through six, Percy has found out he has a half-brother who's a cyclops. Um, the camp is now being run by Tantalus, and I hope that you've read the link about who Tantalus was because he was not a good person. And we saw him very briefly in the last Percy Jackson book. Chiron has been banished. The camp is under attack. Grover is in danger. We're not sure. And things have been a little weird in old Camp Half-Blood, so let's pick it up. The way Tantalus saw it, the Stymphalian birds had simply been minding their own business in the woods and would have not have attacked if Annabeth, Tyson, and I hadn't disturbed them with our bad chariot driving. This was so completely unfair. I told Tantalus to go chase a donut, which didn't help his mood. He sentenced us to kitchen patrol, scrubbing pots and pans, and platters all afternoon in the underground kitchen with the cleaning harpies. The harpies washed with lava instead of water to get that extra clean sparkle and kill 99.9% .9 of all the germs. So Annabeth and I had to wear asbestos gloves and aprons. Tyson didn't mind. He plunged his bare hands right in and started scrubbing. But Annabeth and I had to suffer through hours of hot, dangerous work, especially since there were tons of extra plates. Tantalus had ordered a special luncheon banquet to celebrate Clarice's chariot victory, a full-course meal fe featuring country-fried Stymphalian death bird. The only good thing about our punishment was that it gave Annabeth and me a common enemy and lots of time to talk. After listening to my dream about Grover again, she looked like she might be starting to believe me. If he's really found it, she muttered, and if we really could retrieve it, Hold on, I said. You act like this, whatever it is Grover found, is the only thing in the world that could save the camp. What is it? I'll give you a hint. What do you get when you skin a ram? Messy? She sighed. A fleece. A fleece of a ram. The coat of a ram is called a fleece. And if that ram happens to have golden wool... A golden fleece? Are you serious? Annabeth scraped a plate full of death bird bones into the lava. Percy, remember the Gray Sisters? They said they knew the location of the thing you seek. And they mentioned Jason. 3,000 years ago, they told him how to find the golden fleece. You do know the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, I said, that old movie with the clay skeletons? Annabeth rolled her eyes. Oh my gods, Percy, you are so hopeless. What? I demanded. Just listen. The real story of the fleece. There were these two children of Zeus, Cadmus and Europa, okay? They were about to get offered up as human sacrifices when they prayed to Zeus to save them. So Zeus sent this magical flying ram with golden wool, which picked them up in Greece and carried them all the way to the Colchis in Asia Minor. Well, actually, it carried Cadmus. Europa fell off and died along the way, but that's not important. Well, it's probably important to her. The point is, Cadmus got into Colchis. He sacrificed the golden ram to the gods and hung the fleece in a tree in the middle of the kingdom. The fleece brought prosperity to the land. Animals stopped getting sick. Plants grew better. Farmers had bumper crops. Plagues never visited. That's why Jason wanted the fleece. It can revitalize any land where it's placed. It cures sickness, strengthens nature, cleans up pollution. It could cure Talia's tree. Annabeth nodded. And it would totally strengthen the borders of Camp Half-Blood. But Percy, the fleece, has been missing for centuries. Tons of heroes have searched for it with no luck. But Grover found it, I said. He went looking for Pan, and he found the fleece instead because they both radiate nature magic. It makes sense, Annabeth. We can rescue him and save the camp at the same time. It's perfect. Annabeth has to a little too perfect. Don't you think? What if it's a trap? I remember last summer how Kronos had manipulated our quest 
He almost fooled us into helping him start a war that would have destroyed Western civilization. What choice do we have? I, I asked. Are you going to help me rescue Grover or not? She glanced at Tyson, who'd lost interest in our conversation, and was happily making toy boats out of cups and spoons in the lava. Percy, she said under her breath, we'll have to fight a cyclops, Polyphemus, the worst of the cyclops. And there's only one place his island could be, the Sea of Monsters. Where's that? She stared at me like she thought I was playing dumb. The Sea of Monsters, the same sea Odysseus sailed through, and Jason, and Ananias, and all the others? You mean the Mediterranean? No. Well, yes, but no. Another straight answer. Thanks. Look, Percy, the Sea of Monsters is the sea of all heroes sailed through on their, on their adventures. It used to be in the Mediterranean, yes, but like everything else, it shifts location as the west center of power shifts. Like Mount Olympus being above the Empire State Building, I said, and Hades being under Los Angeles? Right. But a whole sea full of monsters, how could you hide something like that? Wouldn't the mortals notice weird things happening, like ships getting eaten and stuff? Of course they notice. They don't understand, but they know something strange about that part of the ocean. The Sea of Monsters is off the east coast of the U.S. now, just northeast of Florida. The mortals even have a name for it. The Bermuda Triangle? Exactly. I let that sink in. I guess it wasn't stranger than anything else I'd learned since coming to Camp Half-Blood. Okay, so at least we know where to look. It's still a huge area, Percy. Still searching for one tiny island in monster-infested waters. Hey, I'm the son of a sea god. This is my home turf. How hard can it be? Annabeth knit her eyebrows. I mean, she kind of like, mm. We'll have to talk to Tantalus and get approval for a quest. He'll say no. Not if we tell him tonight at campfire in front of everybody. The whole camp will hear. That'll pressure him. He won't be able to refuse. Maybe. A little bit of hope crept into Annabeth's voice. We better get these dishes done. Hand me the lava spray gun, will you? That night at campfire, Apollo's cabin let us sing along. They tried to get everybody's spirits up, but it wasn't easy after the afternoon's bird attack. We all sat around a semicircle of stone steps, singing half-heartedly and watching the bonfire blaze while the Apollo guys strummed their guitars and picked their lyres. Lyres, I'm sorry, lyres. We did all the camp, standard camp numbers, down by the Aegean. I'm my own great-great-great-great-grandpa. This land is Minos land. The bonfire was enchanted, so the louder you sang, the higher it rose, changing color and heat with the mood of the crowd. On a good night, I'd seen it 20 feet high, bright purple, and so hot the whole front row's marshmallows burst into flames. Tonight, the fire was only five feet high, barely warm, and the flame was the color of lint. Dionysus left early. After suffering through a few songs, he muttered something about how even Pinochle with Chiron had been more exciting than this. Then he gave Tantalus a distasteful look and headed back towards the big house. When the last song was over, Tantalus said, Well, that was lovely. He came forward with a toasted marshmallow on a stick and tried to pluck it off real casual-like, but before he could touch it, the marshmallow flew off the stick. Tantalus made a wild grab, but the marshmallow committed suicide, diving into the flames. Tantalus turned back towards us, smiling coldly. Now then, some announcements about tomorrow's schedule. Sir, I said. Tantalus' eye twitched. Our kitchen boy has something to say. Some of the Aries campers snickered, but I wasn't going to let anybody embarrass me into silence. I stood and looked at Annabeth. Thank the God she stood up with me. I said, we have an idea to save the camp. Dead silence, but I could see I got in everybody's interest because the campfire flared bright yellow. Indeed, Tantalus said blandly. Well, if it has anything to do with chariots, the Golden Fleece, I said, I know where it's at. The flames burned orange. Before Tantalus could stop me, I blurted out my dreams about Grover and Polyphemus Island. Annabeth stepped in and reminded everybody what the fleece could do. It sounded more convincing coming from her. The fleece can save the camp, she concluded. I'm certain of it. Nonsense, said Tantalus. We don't need saving. Everybody stared at him until Tantalus started looking uncomfortable. 
But besides, he said quickly, the Sea of Monsters, it's hardly an exact location. You wouldn't even know where to look. Yes, I would, I said. Annabeth leaned towards me and whispered, you would? I nodded. Because Annabeth had jogged something out of my memory when she reminded me about the taxi drive with the Grey Sisters. At the time, the information they gave me made no sense. But now, 30, 31, 75, 12, I said. Okay, Tantalus said. Thank you for sharing those meaningless numbers. They're sailing coordinates. I said, latitude and longitude. Um, I learned about it in social studies. Even Annabeth was impressed. 30 degrees, 31 minutes north, 75 degrees, 12 minutes west. He's right. The Gray Sisters gave us those coordinates. That'd be somewhere off in the Atlantic coast, off the coast of Florida, the Sea of Monsters. We need a quest. Wait a minute, Tantalus said. But the campers took up the chant. We need a quest. We need a quest. The flames rose higher. It isn't necessary, Tantalus insisted. We need a quest. We need a quest. Fine, Tantalus shouted, his eyes blazing with anger. You brats want me to assign a quest? Yes. Very well. I shall authorize a champion to undertake this perilous journey to retrieve the Golden Fleece and bring it back to camp. Or die trying. My heart filled with excitement. I wasn't going to let Tantalus scare me. This was what I needed to do. I was going to save Grover and the camp. Nothing could stop me. I will allow the, our champion to consult the Oracle, Tantalus announced and choose two companions for the journey. And I think the choice of companion of champions is obvious. Tantalus looked at Annabeth and me as if he wanted to flay us alive. The champion should be one who earned the camp's respect, who has proven resourceful in the chariot race and, cour and courageous in the defense of the camp. You shall lead this quest, Clarice. The fire flickered a thousand different colors. The Ares cabin started stopping and cheering. Clarice, Clarice. Clarice stood up looking stunned. Then she swallowed and her chest swelled with pride. I accept the quest. Wait, I shouted. Grover's my friend. The dream came to me. Sit down, yelled one of the Aries campers. You had your chance last summer. Yeah, you just want to be in the spotlight again, another said. Clarice glared at me. I accept the quest, she repeated. I, Clarice, daughter of Aries, will save the camp. The Ares campers cheered even louder. Annabeth protested and the other Athenian campers joined in. Everyone else started taking sides, shouting and arguing and throwing marshmallows. I thought it was going to turn into a full-fledged s'more war until Tantalus shouted, Silence, you brats! His tone stunned even me. Sit down, he ordered, and I will tell you a ghost story. I didn't know what he was up to, but it all we all moved reluctantly back to our seats. The evil aura radiating from Tantalus was as strong as any monster I ever faced. Once upon a time, there was a mortal king who was beloved of the gods. Tantalus put his hand on his chest. I got the feeling he was talking about himself. This king, he said, was allowed to feast on Mount Olympus. But when he tried to take some ambrosia and nectar back to earth to figure out the recipe, just one little doggy bag, mind you, the gods punished him. They banned him from their halls forever. His own people mocked him. His children scolded him. And oh yes, campers, he had horrible children. Children just like you. He pointed a crooked finger at several people in the audience, including me. Do you know what he did to his ungrateful children? Tantalus asked softly. Do you know how he paid back the gods for their cruel punishment? He invited the Olympians for a feast at his palace just to show there was no hard feelings. No one noticed that his children were missing. And when he served the gods dinner, my dear campers, can you guess what was in the stew? No one dared answer. The firelight glowed dark blue, revealing evil, reflecting evilly on Tantalus' crooked face. Oh, the gods punished him in the afterlife, Tantalus croaked. They did indeed. But he had his moment of satisfaction, hadn't he? His children never again spoke back to him or questioned his authority. And do you know what? Rumor has it the king's spirit now dwells at this very camp, waiting for a chance to take revenge on ungrateful, rebellious children. And so, are there any more complaints before we send Clarice off to her quest? Silence.
Tantalus nodded at Clarice. The Oracle, my dear, go on. She shifted uncomfortably like even she didn't want the glory at the price of being Tantalus's pet. Sir, go, he snarled. She bowed awkwardly and hurried off towards the big house. What about you, Percy Jackson, Tantalus said. No comments from our dishwasher? I didn't say anything. I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of punishing me again. Good, Tantalus said, and let me remind everyone, no one leaves this camp without my permission. Anyone who tries, well, if he survives the attempt, they will be expelled forever, and it won't come to that. The harpies will be enforcing curfew from now on, and they're always hungry. Good night, my dear campers. Sleep well. And with a wave of Tantalus' hand, the fire was extinguished, and the campers trailed off towards their cabins in the dark. And that's where I'm going to go ahead and stop this because it's a really long chapter. So we will get the next part tomorrow. So enjoy part one of this. And yes, Tantalus did cook and serve his children to the gods. And that's why his punishment is to never be able to eat or drink. So food for thought. Peace out.